in this section the four rational spirits and we're examining specifically the unclean spirits and in this case specifically the devil and the question of the enmity that was spoken of in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 the first time that the gospel was preached in the Bible and it's very relevant to us right because we find ourselves smack dab right in the middle of it and so how how is it that Satan, as our great adversary and enemy, how is it that he influences us? In, in a sense, um, yeah, how does he influence us with respect to having enmity and hatred against us to try and ultimately bring down the people of God? And so I'm going to be reading from a footnote, and the footnote is in part three of the book, the last chapter in part three. Um, that doesn't have the green or the yellow dot. Um, it's in the page 900s. And uh, the verse specifically is 2 Corinthians 11, 3 through 4. And so this is the footnote that I'm going to be reading. So you can reference it if you want to. But that verse, in that verse, Paul writes to the Corinthians, But I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted by the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached or if you receive another spirit interesting Christians can receive spirits that are not the Holy Spirit okay? if you receive another spirit which you have not received or another gospel which you have not accepted you might well bear with him and so um, and there's a, another section uh, under the human spirit series where I asked the question, can Christians have a demon? Um, the serpent is, the serpent is beguiling Christians. And if it's not possible for Satan to deceive Christians or to influence Christians, then why in the world is Paul fearing that um, we might be beguiled as Eve was beguiled? If it's not possible to be beguiled, then why is he saying it? And he's saying it because it's possible, right? That's why he's saying it. So let's go through um, some sort of, uh, I mean, maybe you call them adjectives or titles or something um, that the Bible gives to Satan. And he recognizes how he influences the people of God. Um, accuser. And so Revelation chapter 12, verses 9 through 10. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world, and he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation, and strength in the kingdom of our God, and the power of our Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Um, if God is for us, who can be against us? It is God who justifies, right? And so... Uh, nonetheless, Satan tries to accuse, and he did it. He did it to Job, if you recall. Um, he uh, said, "Well, you know, he's appearing to be a righteous man, but actually, if you, you know, just follow my seven easy steps, uh, he is uh, the adversary or the resistor." So Zechariah three one, and he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him and the word satan in the hebrew satan um actually means the adversary literally is what it means the adversary and so he uh he resists and he opposes the people of god he tries to stop them from doing what it is that god wants them to do interestingly enough in daniel chapter 10 we see the same kind of picture where we have the Michael who we know from uh, elsewhere in scripture as an archangel and he's fighting against the prince of Grecia and the prince of Persia and uh, the enemy is resisting uh, the angelic powers the holy angels too and so we we see that that Satan is just being used to resist the kingdom of God and 
you know, how, how does somebody get stronger? Do you get stronger by sitting on a beach strip at d drinking a, a pina colada or whatever, eating a chocolate chip cookie? Like, is that when you get stronger? No, you get stronger when you face um, opposition, when you face resistance, when you face difficulty. Uh, now, obviously, if you, if you face too much difficulty, it, it, it will kill you. It will snuff out your strength. But to, to face a little bit of difficulty, you go to the gym and you press against some resistance and you get stronger and stronger and stronger. You can't do it all at once, but over time it adds up to something, right? And so God is using the devil as his handmaiden and as his pawn and tool and puppet to come against us, but he's doing it for our good. He's not doing it, I mean, if God wanted us to be ruined, come on, I mean... You know, anvils fall from the sky or some such thing or, you know, like he could he could just stop, take his restraining power off of Satan and we'd all be dead like very, very quickly. Like if God wanted to smite us, like that's not a problem. I mean, it's really just just the slightest whisper from his lips and it's done. Right. Why does God have the devil on the earth and why is God allowing the devil to do these things to his beloved people? Because we are not cheaply made, we're forged in fire. He's strengthening us and training us and preparing us so that we can reign and rule with him in eternity. And he's worthy, not a blubbering, blumbering fools, but he's, he's worthy of, of uh, excellence, the best, right? And this is his method, according to his wisdom, of preparing his people, forging his people in fire in order to be fit for service. Uh, blinder. So Matthew 16, 21 through 25, um, from that time forth, began, G began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again on the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense to me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, for whosoever will save his life will lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake will save it. And so um, Satan or Jesus is the one who uses the term Satan, not anybody else. Right. And uh, it would appear from this scripture, reading it fairly literally, as I have a tendency to do, that um, Satan is blinding Peter and influencing him to not look beneath the surface, to not set his sights on the unseen, but to just simply say, you know, Jesus, I have affection for you, and I don't want you to be hurt. Um, but he's missing the big picture. He's blinded, right? He's missing the picture. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3-4, through four, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world have blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine unto them. Tempter, First Corinthians 21. First Chronicles, excuse me, First Corinthians 21 would be a very interesting chapter since it doesn't exist. All right, First Chronicles 21, 1, and Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Um, interestingly, if you look, and I don't, I don't have the exact citation with me, but if you look in the, um, probably in the Kings, where the same passage is recorded, it says that God told David to number Israel. And so then you're like, well, how can it be that Satan did it? Well, the way that God did it is he used Satan, right? Because that's what God does is he sends the enemy. He sends Satan. He uses Satan for his glory and for his purposes. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Then was Jesus led of the spirit of the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Um, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he afterwards uh, was hungry, was in hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. And so Satan is called the tempter, and that's what he does, is he tempts. Um, 1 Thessalonians 3, 5, For this cause, when I can no longer 
forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. Devourer, First Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. And of course, you know, the question can... It, see, it seems like some Christians, and perhaps more of the charismatic variety, oh, no weapon formed against me will be able to prosper. And ultimately, is that the heritage of those who serve the Lord? Yes, ultimately, but does, does that mean that, that nothing bad will ever happen to you and Satan will just never be able to touch you at all? Well, no, I mean, obvi obviously, I mean, look at what we just read with Peter. If that's true, that Satan can just never, ever touch the people of God, then how is it that Peter denied Christ? You know, like, like, the, like there's so many examples. How is it that um, Paul has a thorn in his flesh, a messenger from Satan, all of 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 12? If the enemy can just never touch the people of God, then how can we see repeatedly through Scripture the enemy judging the people of God? It even says in a place in Revelation that the, the, the enemy is actually defeating the people of God. And again, that was, a, that was a temporary circumstance. It's not the end of the story. But like that, this some kind of notion that, well, the devil can never touch me. I mean, it's a self-serving, feel-good theology that has no root in the Bible and it has no basis in reality. I mean, of course, the devil is very thrilled for people to come up with a theology that the devil can't touch anybody because then he can touch people and it can never be his fault, right? It's always chance or luck or the other guy or whatever, but it can never be his fault if, if we insist that he can't touch people. Oh, and of course, we have to ask ourselves the question, well, why in the world is Peter writing to Christians and telling them to be sober and to be vigilant because of this adversary oh peter bro don't you know you know i know you're supposedly an apostle but bro don't you know the adversary can't touch me can't touch me a little bit no 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 like okay we would do well instead of coming up with a theology and acting like our doctrine of our apostles is like we're smarter than that we would do well to recognize that they're teaching us. And the reality is that Satan is a devourer, and that ain't a pretty thing. There are some people that get knocked down in a hard way, in a difficult way. And that's real. And that's real life. None of this fantasy nonsense that Satan can't touch me. <sighs> Destroyer. Um, let's see, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 5, to deliver such an one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And so, so Satan is actually so puffing up the flesh of this, this man who actually apparently is sealed in the Holy Spirit because of the way that Paul refers to it, that his spirit may be saved. I mean, if he utterly belongs to Satan, then his spirit ain't saved and he ain't going to be saved. Right? And Satan so puffs him up that it literally destroys itself. Deceiver. Of course, of course, Satan is the deceiver. John 8, 44. You are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And so, ye are of your father, the devil. This, I suspect that this is not a popular theology to teach in the church, telling people there are some people that belong to the devil. And um, we're going to talk in the, this series on enmity. This is specifically dealing with how the devil is our adversary, but yet he's also called by Paul, the God of this world, and people who are in his snare, aka everybody who does not have the Holy Spirit, aka the vast majority of people who have ever lived, okay? Satan has them in his snare, and he can make them do whatever he, he wants them to do. Now, if you go and you ask an unbeliever, tell me, are you in Satan's snare, and does he play you like a fiddle night and day? And you do whatever he wants you to do. And I was like, wow, 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 I do whatever I want to do. Whatever, right? But how, how does he rule in the hearts of men? 
He puffs up with lust, an appetite, an affection, a desire, an urge, a longing, an unction. And you're like, oh, I want to feel like that. Oh, I want to feel like that. Oh, I want to feel like this. Whatever the thing is, it may be sex, drugs, rock and roll, money, the list goes on, right? But out of your heart, you're feeling like you want to do something. And so he, in a sense, is undercover influencing people. And then they're feeling like it's them, right? You're not walking around thinking like, oh my gosh, there's like alien rays beaming into my brain. Like people aren't walking around thinking that there's external influence, an influence that is external to them that is causing them to feel a certain way. Most people don't think like that. They think like, my feeling is my own and I do what I feel like I wanna do, right? And so if you ask somebody, are you in a snare of the devil? There are actually, I've actually talked to some people who admit that they're in a snare of the devil, which is kind of funny. But most people are like, I do what I want to do. I do what I want to do when I want to do it. Me, me, me. Something along those lines, right? People do, people feel at least like, and that's why he's an excellent deceiver, because he makes you feel like it's them. They're not under some kind of control. They're doing whatever they feel like doing. He just happens to be supplying the feeling, right? Um... No truth in him. That's kind of scary, honestly, because you can't you can't talk him down. Like the only thing that's stopping the devil is the restraining power of the Holy Spirit. Like you're not going to convince the devil of anything. There's no truth in him. Like he'll slit your throat without even thinking about it, and no pangs of guilt or conscience. He'll just go on to the next person if he can. Uh, Acts five three. But Peter said. And Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back the price of the land? And so would, you know, so Ananias is feeling like, you know, like, hey, I can get the prestige of saying that I'm giving something, but I can, you know, keep some money for myself too. And so it's like, if you asked Ananias, Ananias, is Satan influencing you? And he's like, no, I'm just scheming. Like, no, I'm just getting what I feel like getting. I'm doing what I feel like doing, right? I mean, that's what Ananias is probably going to say, right? Before he dropped dead. <laughs> Before he dropped dead. Prince of devils. Matthew 12, 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. And so it's very interesting. Um, and you see this over and over again. For example, whenever Lazarus was raised from the dead, the Pharisees aren't like the atheists of today. Just like, oh, there's no miracles. There's no miracle. That never happened. Prove it. You can't prove it. You're just a deluded person. They didn't deny that Jesus did miracles. I mean, these are his enemies, right? They never denied that he did miracles. They never denied that he cast out demons. They never denied that he raised the dead. Their strategy, at least one of their strategies, was this fellow doth cast out devils, but by the prince of devils. And so they say, yeah, he does it, but he does it by Satan. Okay. The point is, is Satan is called the prince of devils, right? Um, how does Satan tempt? Obviously, he, if Satan is a finite being. I mean, he's close. If we're, if we're going to, like sometimes people have a tendency to put God and Satan in opposition, but it's not a fair comparison. I mean, it's like, it's like comparing an ant to the universe, Right? We can't even we can't even get to Pluto. We can't even move around within our own solar system, let alone another solar system, let alone another galaxy, let alone the two trillionth galaxy. Like nowhere close. Like how can you compare an ant? How can you compare an ant to the universe? Well, it's an exceedingly difficult thing to do. In the same way, how can you compare a, a finite being with a fixed beginning? And with just finite limitations of where he can be and what he can do with a being that has no beginning, that has no end, that has no boundary, that has no limit on their understanding or their power. How can you compare those two things? Jesus, you can't. You can't. Um, so my point in saying this is as prince of the devils, how does how does Pharisee or Pharisee. How does Satan operate a lot of this stuff that we're talking about here? You know, there, there are uh, elsewhere, there are called spirits of error. There are called seducing spirits, doctrines of devils. How does he do all this stuff? 
Satan is, is just like you. He's a person just like you. You can only be at one place at one time. He might be bigger than you, in which case he might be able to see a little bit bigger area. But you can't be here in China at the same time. You can't be in, in Vietnam and Cambodia at the same time. You can't be here and across the street at the same time, right? And so how does he do it? He's the prince of devils. There's a higher, just like there's a hierarchy in the angelic, as in archangel and angel, arche being a chief, whereas angel is not a chief, right? Satan is the prince of devils, and he delegates authority to his principalities and powers to go do his his um, conniving and his schemes, right? So that's that's how Satan does it. Um, the ruler of this world, John twelve thirty one. Now is the judgment of this world, and now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Um, in uh, Second. Uh, Corinthians, Paul calls Satan the god of this world. Um, we actually, didn't we read that? Second Corinthians chapter four, verse three. Yeah, the god of the or verse four, the god of this world. First um, John five nineteen, and we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. Or another translation would be under the power of the wicked one. Uh, Satan is a murderer. Um, John 8, 44, you have your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He's an oppressor. Uh, Acts 10, 38, uh, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. You know, we have this whole cultural Marxism, like, oh, this group is oppressed or that group is oppressed, and, and the oppressor, of that group is some kind of a, another human group, not the same group, right? The, oppress, the oppressor in this world, not fighting against flesh and blood, but against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly realms, the oppressor in this world is not some human group, ultimately. The oppressor in this world is Satan. And so let's get our, let's get our act together and let's fight the real battle and not get sidelined fighting a fake battle that actually is just diverting our power and diverting our resource and our focus and our energies on 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 a lie. Uh, he's a thief. John ten ten. The thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And so this this uh, this recognition of the devil being a thief. And this verse, John 10, 10, you see it's in the context of the devil influencing people. And the people are, you know, judge a tree by its fruit. The tree people are engaging in a certain particular activity. And that particular activity is satanically inspired, right? And so we see the, the fruit of his heart, but... It, in this case, it's just manifested through the hands of men um, as opposed to us being told that Satan directly is doing it.